to welcome you and to give some information about aging and workability. My purpose is to talk about aging, to let you know something about the Active Aging Consortium for Asia Pacific, to talk about the opportunities for older adults in work, volunteering, and training, and then to end with some recommendations. So my next slide, please. Of course, the topic today is aging, and you all know that the population of older people in the world is getting bigger and bigger. You can see from this slide. In the next slide, not all countries are aging at the same rate. So you can see here that the aging is the most rapid in Japan. And by 2050, almost 37% of the population in Japan will be elderly. And how does that compare in Indonesia? Indonesia is also aging rapidly. And you can see the chart is going up. So by 2050, 17% will be elderly. So this is a rapid growth. It doesn't matter if you're 30% or 17%. The fact is, it's going up very quickly. Of course, we know the reasons for this. People are living longer, we are healthier, and that is the good news. Fertility is going down, and the result is we have an aging population. The next slide. In this slide, this is what we are worried about as we think about the older future. And that is, how many working people do we have for every older person? Because it's the working people that are paying the taxes and providing the care. So if you can see, this is the dependency ratio. And the first line is the European Union. In 2002, they had four working people for every older adult. But by 2050, they will only have two working people for every older adult. So you can see the little faces there. And uh, Indonesia is down the last row. And in 2002, there were 13 working people for every older adult. So you have plenty of working people to care for your older people. But now, in uh, coming up in 2050, there will only be four working people for every older so this is a big change. It's not good, it's not bad, it's just a change and we have to prepare for it. So many countries have social security or pension for their older people so that they continue to live independently and care for themselves. Almost all of the industrial societies have social security, but many of the developing countries are still developing social security system and so there are uh, many things that we can learn about social security from other countries but even if you look at this graph oh on the next slide please at the bottom even in the US we have a very well developed social security system in 1950 we have 16 workers to pay for one older beneficiary but today we only have three workers paying for each beneficiary. So even in the United States, we are challenged by the social security system. How can we continue to make it work? The next slide. I always like to remind people who invented social security. Did you know it was Otto von Bismarck from Germany? And he invented it quite a long time ago, 1900. Of course, there were not many older people in 1900. The life expectancy was only 50. And so he chose the age 65 for the time when they can get the pension. If we use the same ratio, can you see here? Uh, if we use the same ratio and we divide 50 into 5,000, and we can get the new retirement age given that we are all living longer, if you do this, it seems like our social security system should not start until we were 100. So this is uh, something to think about. 
for Autobahn Bismarck. Next slide, please. Now we have many problems in the U.S. with our Social Security, and we are trying to address them. And these are some of the things that we are talking about doing in our possible solutions. Maybe decrease our benefits, increase our retirement age, increase the amount of money that every worker contributes, increase the taxes, so even if someone gets Social Security, they still pay some tax on it, and invest the Social Security fund into some high interest, if we can only find high interest investments that will solve our problems. But it's a little hard at this time. The next slide, please. In the United States, we often look to Europe, to the EU. What are they doing because they seem so advanced for us? They have a very good social welfare system, but still, they are having problems in the EU. And they also make the same recommendations. They must raise the retirement age, and they must decrease the pension amounts. And they're also thinking of requiring that every worker save. So some money will be taken out for Social Security, but some will be taken out just for savings. This is uh, something they already do in uh, Singapore. I think they have the mandated 22% coming out of your paycheck. Also in Europe, they are now having programs to tell women to have more babies. So they have programs that will pay the mother to stay home and care for the baby. Or pay the father to stay home and take care of the baby. It doesn't matter. Mother or father can stay home in Europe. And they're also, because of the EU structure, they're opening the migration. And so many younger people are coming from the former Russian countries to work in England, to work in France, to work in Scandinavia to help with the health care. These are all things they're doing there. Next slide. So, of course, it's interesting to think of what's going on in the United States or in EU, but those are rich countries. And those countries were lucky to be, first they were rich, then they were old. But many countries in the world are getting old before they are getting rich. And so we cannot look and use the solutions from the U.S. and Europe because they will not work everywhere. They don't even work in U.S. and Europe, we are finding out. So we constantly must adjust. But we must develop our own solutions that fit the country. So the next slide, please. So we would like to promote instead this concept of active aging. And this was promoted by the World Health Organization. And it means that everyone, regardless of age, should be given opportunities for health, for participation, and for security. Next slide. And we really need to change our thinking about who is old and what is old. So in, in the uh, Hawaii, we say, if you are 50, no, you are really 30. You must act like you are 30. If you are 60, you must act like you are 40. So I am the new 40. Yeah. And uh, if you are 80, you are the new 60. So this is, this is how we have to think if we're going to live to be 100 or older than 100. I think this will become very common. Okay, and active aging also means that we must stay healthy, healthy until death. And you will hear more about healthy aging on today's program, I know. But in this graph, you see that in the traditional society, the line that goes down, D, it shows that in traditional society, maybe, maybe after 20, people start to become disabled. But the ideal society, if they stay healthy until they're 100 and then die, just like that. Yeah. That is our wish. We want to live long, but we don't want to grow old. Yeah. I heard that today. Yes. Next slide. Who is responsible for active aging? We are all responsible. And individuals have a responsibility, as we heard earlier. 
we heard that everyone must adopt a good lifestyle. But also, the government has some responsibilities to develop social, social policies that can help us and develop age-friendly environments, environments that are accessible to older people and to help develop intergenerational relations. So I would like to introduce our organization called ACAP, the Active Aging Consortium Asia Pacific. We are a group of gerontologists across the region who have embraced the active aging concept. So we believe that individuals must stay healthy and we believe that governments need to create social policy that is friendly, makes society more friendly for older adults and opens more opportunities. You can see a picture of us from our last meeting in Japan. Our founder of ACAP is here, Dr. Ogawa is here. Uh, I'm the second president, he is the first president. And uh, Dr. Tree also is in the picture because we had our meeting in uh, Japan. She came. So we have members from all of the countries, Mongolia, South Korea, China, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, Japan, and Hawaii so far. And we are hope uh, Myanmar will also become a, a member from us soon. So we are very interested in promoting active aging in the region and helping countries come up with their own solutions that will work for them. The next slide. This is a, a picture that we show in the center is the older person and it means that the older person is responsible, must take responsibility, but on the outside are all of the things that the government can consider creating policy around. And these include some things for healthy aging and some things for the environment and design. We'll have some speakers later today talking about design and economics and <coughs> also the universal safety net and so forth. But today in my lecture, I would like to give you some examples of some best practices in just three areas. So the three boxes that are green, the opportunities for work, the opportunities for volunteering, and the opportunities for retraining. But I would like to share with you are some ideas from other countries, what other countries are doing in these three areas for older adults. Next slide. So in the area of supporting work for older adults, I will talk about four areas, four ways that we are trying to support continued work. Next slide. Of course, one thing to do is to raise the retirement age. In the past, many times, you reach a certain age, you must quit. And I know many, many people who are still young in their 50s and 60s very angry about having to stop work and retire. So many countries now are raising retirement age. And I think the retirement age in Indonesia is 60. Going up. Going up. Oh. And look at your life expectancy in comparison is 70. So you have many people, many years in retirement. Right now, I think the highest retirement age is 67 in Germany. So this is one thing many countries are raising the retirement age. I think Singapore also is 67 or coming up to 67. Another thing that this is something that we do at the University of Hawaii. We, of course, we want the professors to retire because then the younger professors can come into the system. But the older professors have knowledge. We don't want to lose it. So we have an arrangement that you can retire, but then you can come back to work for 40% time and your responsibilities are half. You teach classes, you mentor, but you don't have to go to any meetings. And the university saves money because your salary is 40% and then no benefits. 
so they save money on that. So this is a way that we can have retirement, but also benefit from the wisdom of the professors who have years and years of experience and knowledge. This is a good program, I think. Okay, next. Here is another program in the United States that was created by our government. It is called Senior Corps. Senior Corps. You have to be 60 years or older in order to get this job. And there's uh, three kinds of jobs you can do. You can be a foster grandparent. So if you're an older person, you are assigned to work with some young people that have special needs. Maybe they are disabled, maybe they have learning disability, or maybe they are uh, in a wheelchair or something like that. So you have an assignment for a foster grandparent. And you get a small stipend and health insurance for this. Another one is senior companion. So the well elderly get paid a small amount to work with the elderly who need help. So the young elderly working with the old elderly and there's a small payment for this. Another one is RSVP, which is the seniors and they are assigned to nonprofit agencies so they can help the nonprofit agencies and they get a stipend for this. So all of these jobs are very attractive to especially our seniors who are immigrants to Hawaii because then they work these jobs, they will qualify for our social security system after 10 years. So many older adults take these jobs. Another one that we have is called the AmeriCorps and the Peace Corps. Very similar idea. Well, people going to work for people who need help and there's a small stipend. AmeriCorps is volunteers any age serving in the United States, and Peace Corps volunteers any age serving in a foreign country. The stipend is small. I'm also a Peace Corps volunteer before. I worked uh, two years in the Philippines in the 70s. So it's a very rewarding volunteer experience. But it is the policy of our government that 10% of our volunteers must be seniors, must be elderly because our government believes that older people need more opportunities to volunteer and to work. Another program is run by our AARP, Association for Retired People, American Association for Retired People. And this organization actually works with business oh. to convince them to develop jobs for older people. And one of the businesses is the Home Depot. And they train older people to uh, work in stores, work as in sales, and they also work with the company to tell them how do you attract older people, older workers, how do you retain older workers. So this has been a very good partnership nationally. And another thing to do is to create a small business for older adults, and I, I believe we heard a little bit about this earlier, creating a small business for elders. This slide I borrowed from uh, my colleague, Dr. Ogawa from Japan. This is a business called Iurodori, Iurodori business in Japan, and it's all run by older people. They collect the leaves and the flowers from the plants. And these are used by the restaurants for decorating the plate. The business is, employs many seniors. The average age of the worker is 70, and the oldest worker is 94. And this has been a very successful older business, older person business in Japan. And next slide. And this one I, I was uh, teaching in China in Wuhan, China, in the summer. And this is a business that they are developing in China. You know, in traditional society in China, the grandparents care for the grandchildren. But the professors at Wuhan, their parents live in a far place, so their parents cannot come, or their parents are busy, or their parents are still working. So they found other older people 
to care for their children, pick up their children after school, and maybe help with homework, and then watch them until the parents came home. So this has become a business for older people in China. Very interesting. Okay, next please. So there, now we will talk about volunteering and some ideas about increasing opportunities for volunteering among older adults. There are four kinds of volunteering for agencies. Government has volunteer opportunities. Religious organizations can create volunteer opportunities. The civic and social organizations and business. All of these can create opportunities for volunteering. So I'll give some examples from different countries. Next. So in the United States, we have a very interesting government program that attracts many seniors. It's called the Volunteer in the Park. Volunteer in the Park. So we have the national parks, and we have older people that volunteer there to come and care for the park, or clean the park, or watch out for the park and to make sure no one destroys the plants. And they get to live in a, a trailer. Maybe this is not attractive in Indonesia, but in the United States, people like to live in trailers that so they can drive, they can live here this summer and live there that summer. So they're living in the trailers. Some people don't have homes, they only have trailers, and they live from park to park. And they get free living in the park and then they will volunteer. So this has been very attractive for many seniors. Next. Another one is tour leaders. So we have in, in the United States not only parks, but historical monuments and historical sites. And we need people, we need seniors, we've employed or we've asked seniors to volunteer to guide the tourists. Because the older people know the site, they can't explain the site. So they're tour guides. And my favorite is this man. He is the volunteer fishing leader. So he has so much fun because he gets to go fishing every day for free, but then he has to explain everything to the tourists. He likes to jump. There is also a volunteer program for retired people that was developed in China by the government. Because in China, the retirement age is also uh, 55 or 60. And there's many people who are still very fit and active and would like to contribute. So some retired workers are volunteer to go to the far parts of China to help run the hospital or to help train the teachers or to help with the trees. This man is a tree expert. He worked for the Department of Agriculture for many years and now the government sent him as a volunteer to go and check the trees in the different provinces where they do not have the same expertise. Religious organizations, of course, are a very good place to develop volunteer opportunities. This is a program in Hawaii called Project Donna, and Donna means to give of yourself to others. And again, it's older people who have, uh, who do not need money, who are, have, have a pension, but they want to help others. So it's the young, well elderly helping the older, frail elderly. And they do very simple things. Maybe they will just go once a week to sit and talk with an older person that cannot go outside, maybe write letters, maybe go shopping for the person, or maybe help by cleaning their yard. Something like that. A small job. There are civic and social organizations that like to create volunteer opportunities for older adults. And this is an example from Korea where they have had older adults come and they teach them how to do health education in the form of a drama. So in this picture, they are uh, pretending that they are a family and one of them is pretending to have 
of Alzheimer's disease, and another is pretending to be the daughter that takes care, and another one is the husband, and another one is the granddaughter, and the sister, and the brother-in-law. And then they're, they're talking on the stage, oh, you should do more, you should help me, we should put mother in a home, oh, you should be nice to mother. So they're having a drama. The drama is about 15 minutes, but afterwards the audience asks so many questions. So it's a very good way for education. And this is, uh, only the seniors can do this. They are fabulous actors and actresses. And some now feel very famous because they go out and they are recognized for their acting. And of course, there's also opportunities to volunteer with the Red Crescent and the Red Cross. Many of our retired workers in Hawaii, social worker, retired nurse, retired doctor, are volunteering for disasters. And uh, perhaps you also have that opportunity here. Okay. Business partners. Also, we have a group called SCORE, which is retired executives. So the bosses, the retired bosses, who still like to give advice but don't want to work full time, there's a volunteer program for them to go and train new businesses or give one-on-one -on -one help to people who want to start their businesses. This is a very successful program. They have helped more than 7 million businesses in the U.S. over the past 20 years. So now I will talk about opportunities for retraining older adults because if you want older adults to work or volunteer, they may need some extra training. We all need continuous training. I need continuous training. But often there's not opportunities. And I'll tell you about some programs that have opened now to give those opportunities. So the first one is, next slide please. In the United States, we call it the CSEP, the Senior Community Service Employment <coughs> Program, a government program in every state. And workers get training in computers, in uh, cell phone, <coughs> digital camera, and Palm Pilot. And then they are placed with an agency where they can practice those skills and help the agency. And after their internship, they have a paid internship. And after that, the agency is encouraged to hire them. The next one is a program in Korea, also to train older adults on the internet and the computer and the PowerPoint and email. And this one, not only do they train the older adults, but they train the old, some of the older adults that become teachers for the internet. So they call themselves the internet navigator. And so there's older adults teaching other older adults about the computers. This has been a very successful program in Korea. And another one, also from Japan, is a very, very interesting program. It's not exactly training for work, but training for retirement. Because many men in Japan work very hard with the company, but they don't know anything about cooking, or cleaning, or children. And so after retirement, they get depressed, and the wife gets depressed too. So this training program for men who retire to teach them how to cook, and how to clean, and how to shop, and how to say, I love you. <laughs> and the marriages are much happier if the men take this training in their retirement. Do you need that in Indonesia? No, no. All the men are perfect. <laughs> I think we need it in the United States. OK, and another option is uh, this is retraining, but uh, many times for pleasure that many universities now in the United States and in England and Australia and maybe, I don't know, Indonesia, will have free courses for older adults. So you can go after the age 60 or 65, you can go to the university for free. And many people take advantage of that. So for example, when I taught my course in aging, I always had one or two older people in my class. 
but they didn't have to take any tests. But when we talk about a subject, they can say, yes, that happened to me, or yes, this was my experience. And so it made it very alive for the young students in the class. It was excellent. Uh, some of these programs will have only older, retired people teaching, and older, retired people as students, and some mix of older and the younger. But there's all different ways to have free education for older adults. And another thing that we do in the United States, because you know we are very active, we try to retrain our seniors for change, for social change. How do you bring the seniors together, older people together, and teach them how to help the government change policy, how to help society change the way it thinks about aging? So you activate your older adults. And we have some training opportunities in this, and one is from the Hawaii one is called Kokua Council. I would like to show this gentleman on the right side. is my professor before, Tony Lenzer, and when he retired, he took the training in social change, and now he's a consultant for the legislature about older people. He taught gerontology for many years, but now he actually works for the legislature on aging. And they pay him, not very much, but they pay him something for this work. So he's a very important to uh, the uh, legislators are very young, they don't know about aging, so he's a very important person for them. And also the AARP again, they have a lot of uh, training in lobbying skills. And their seniors then are brought together to go to Washington, D.C. to educate the lawmakers about aging. So these are just some examples, and I know I went very quickly through the examples. If you would like any more details about them, you can email me, I will give you my email address. But the bottom line is, if we are going to live a long time, and if we really want older people to work, we also have to stay healthy. And we will hear more about healthy aging, but active aging societies need to invest in health and health promotion if we're going to make this work. So my summary, of course, the world is aging. This is not a surprise. We must support older adults as contributors. And to do that, we must expand opportunities for older adults to continue working and volunteering and getting retrained and staying healthy. What specifically can be done? You have some answers here already in Indonesia. There was a very big meeting about aging in Madrid in 2002 that came out with many recommendations. And gerontologists in Asia have already met, they met in Macau in 2007 to make the recommendations fit to Southeast Asia. Dr. Tree was part of the delegation that was working on these recommendations. So we already have many of the answers. We already know what to do. And the next slide shows some of the recommendations that came from the Macau meeting that relate to work and education and healthy aging. One of them is to promote the healthy lifestyles. Government needs, social policy needs to be developed to help that. Number two, promote access to employment and volunteering. Number three, support and encourage lifelong learning. Number four, promote the use of technology to enhance connectivity and communication and advocacy. And expand and improve the coverage of social security. So these are things that we know are important. And I've shown you some examples of how other countries are working to actualize recommendations like that. And another thing that you can do is to support meetings like this. And of course, you are supporting meetings like this because it's very important that we come together and we share ideas with each other and we encourage each other in this work. So in the, you will see I have a picture of a meeting that took place in June. The Southeast Asian countries came together to talk about active aging 
and uh, Dr. Tree is in that picture, and Dr. Ogawa is in that picture coming together. So congratulations on sponsoring that here in Indonesia, in Jakarta, in June. Oh, very good. Okay, many of many people we recognize are there. Very good. And then I left a spot here for our picture because we must take a picture of our conference and put it here for the continuing slideshow about active aging so we can have a document that we are working hard. So in conclusion, I just must say that we all have work to do. We all have work to do to promote active aging. And I really congratulate the sponsors of this meeting for your vision and your commitment to bring us together to talk about active aging. Thank you very much. I have to say, Tarima Kasi Banyak. Thank you, Dr. Captain Snow. Mahalo Niloa, that's what they say in, in Hawaii about this.